Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Justin Smith Ruyu about tech solutionism, algorithmic content, and the decline of the academic humanities. Justin, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Spencer. So today we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion touching on a bunch of interesting topics, like what's the limit to solving problems with tech? What's the deal with algorithmic art? Is there a decline in the academic humanities? And if so, what's it all about? So let's start with the first one, um, limits of tech solutionism. You want to give us a quick introduction to that topic? Sure. Well, I guess, you know, I I published a book last year called The Internet is Not What You Think It Is. Um, And at the time, I think, well, a book published in 2022 that talks about, broadly speaking, the philosophy of technology is already uh, prehistoric. You know, you have to come out with a new book every year in order to keep up. Uh, Since it's been published, we have... um, seen significant new shockwaves moving through debates around technology, uh, in particular having to do with artificial intelligence. Um, And in each case, and most recently, I read just yesterday, the guru behind uh, the new uh, AI revolution, um, Altman is now talking about scanning uh, 8 billion irises. I don't know if you saw this in order to um, give us a unique ID through our eyeball minority report style. And this is going to be the basis, uh, so they're saying, of a new um, economy where we will get micropayments once we're properly ID'd through our iris. Uh, for our activities online or something like this that. This is uh, Sam, Sam uh, Altman's so, World Coin. That's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, Sam Altman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are things that were not on the horizon, on the agenda two years ago when I finished my book. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think uh, one thing, this fast pace of developments makes us quickly realize is we're just going to keep experiencing new shockwaves year after year and month after month. And all of these shockwaves are going to have a particular contour to them. In particular, we're going to have people like Altman talking about these new developments as if they were solving pre-existing problems. Whereas, in fact, if you look at this from a kind of zoomed out history of science and history of technology perspective, and that is my kind of starting point as a scholar, we are constantly I mean, almost obviously constantly generating new problems that would require solutions. So the tech world then is both generating and solving its own problems in a way that could make you easily think if we were not so intent on innovation, (laughs) um, we might be able to inhabit a world that didn't have so many problems that need to be solved. And it's naive in this regard to think that we're ever going to arrive at a point where the solutions have been definitively or relatively permanently laid out and we can just chill for a while. That's just obviously not going to happen. And this is something that I think, honestly, maybe I'm just a late learner or it takes things uh, longer to get through my thick skull. But this is something that I had really not appreciated to such a degree until indeed after I finished this book. I feel like the history of technology now is plainer to me um, than it was even for many years writing about it, both in the you know 21st century context, but also more deeply in the context of the kind of centuries-long 
development of the basic um, kind of apparatuses that shape the modern world, you know, the development that really got going in the 17th century. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about with this problem. I personally share uh, broadly, I don't want to say, <laughs> um, you know, I'm not a radical, I, I'm, I'm not an anarcho-primitivist uh, or anything like that, but broadly speaking, I share the view of someone like Wendell Berry that whatever technological revolution we manage to bring about, say, um, in energy, for example, we're going to uh, create for ourselves a new mess out of it. If, we, As Wendell Berry likes to say, if we did manage to break our addiction to fossil fuels by using, say, solar panels or uh, wind or something like that, we would inevitably very soon find ourselves in a world that is dangerously overrun with solar panels and windmills or the like, right? There's no definitive end solution to this process. So when it comes to technology creating new problems, I think that people classically will think about environmental problems coming from technology or more recently, they'll think about things like social media addiction. But the way you describe this, it sounds like you think this is sort of a general principle. It's not just these, you know, a couple exceptions, but it's technology is constantly creating problems. So maybe you could give a couple more recent examples of the way technology has created specific problems that didn't exist before. Well, I, I, I suppose, I, I mean, my favorite example is um, the, the automobile, right? The innovation that made it possible for people to live um, further from their workplace than they previously did. And we know that, you know, Henry Ford was really keen on ensuring that Ford employees all had their own Model Ts uh, uh, or whatever the model was so that they could commute. And uh, this fundamentally changed the layout of our cities and led us all, or many of us, not me and probably not you in Manhattan, uh, led many of us to spend a good part of our lives um, uh, in traffic jams at risk of fatal collisions, polluting the atmosphere for something that initially looked like an improvement, looked like it was something that would make our lives better because we can get from point A to point B faster. It's true you can get, get from point A to point B faster, but uh, the pressures that require you to get from point A to point B might not actually be improvements, right? Um, so technology Technological innovation creates new pressures, which then just creates a, let's say, a new shape of life um, that we might not, with sufficient hindsight, see uh, as an improvement over what we had before. And I think this is uh, what, what is crystal clear in the case of the automobile is, in fact, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, the general shape of technological innovation and that characterizes everything we've accomplished so far, perhaps since the, the discovery of fire. <laughs> um, and this is not, and pe people often hear me talking like this and very quickly they'll resort to that pretty crude label of um, Luddite. And this is obviously not simply Ludditism, right? That creates a false dichotomy. Either you love it or you hate it, and anyone who has a critical gaze or takes a long-term approach must ipso facto hate it and want to smash up all the machines. No, that's not the conclusion we can we, we ought to draw. Again, this is not uh, an anarcho-primitivist critique or anything like that, but it is um, trying to take honest stock of what what technological innovation actually does in human history in order to better anticipate the limits of the, the solutionist uh, mindset. It seems to me that there are two very different perspectives you could have on this. One is that when new technology comes out, it creates problems that are about as big as the problems it solves. And so it sort of doesn't get you anywhere. It, you know, on net, you're not making, you're advancing one way, but you're 
making things worse than another. Another view is that it tends to create problems, but those problems are most of the time less bad than the, than the things being fixed, which is more compatible with a view that over time, technology has actually massively improved people's lives, even though it has created problems. And I'm wondering where you fall between those two. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, here's an interesting thought experiment. You're behind the veil of ignorance in a kind of John Rawls sense. Imagine you're in baby heaven and you're going to get plunged into the world. Uh, you can pick your time period, but that's all you know. That's all all you get to pick. So you can you can arrive in say 1000 AD when almost everybody's a peasant and the life expectancy is like 30 years old, and the feudal lord has the droit de seigneur over your wife and so on. Um, or you can be born in the 21st century and your life expectancy is uh, 77, um, and you have. Uh, at least a nominal liberty um, to go about your own life in the way you see fit and so on and so on, even if it's hard to get the money to do that often and so on, right? So, uh, but uh, if you choose the 21st century, then you've got nuclear weapons that could destroy the planet hundreds of times over, hanging over your head every second of your life, which is basically like leading your whole, li whole life with someone pointing a gun at you, if you think about it, right? And similar I could rehash all the other plausible apocalyptic scenarios, but we're familiar with all of these. If I were in that original position, I think I would take th the 1000 AD life. So whether the current situation of human life on Earth is better now than it was a thousand years ago, I think uh, I'm not going to say uh, simply yes or no, but I'm going to say that it will always depend on which elements of life you take into consideration. And there are some pretty compelling considerations that would make you think that life in the 21st century is much worse and that it's much worse because of our technological innovations. And these would include not just nuclear weapons, but also you know, plastic and synthetic fertilizers and um, a number of other things that have made our position in the, in, on this planet extremely precarious. So in this respect, then, yes, we do solve problems with technology sometimes, but on balance, um, the defense is going to have a pretty tough time against the prosecution if our modern technological lay of the land is put on trial. So I think a lot of listeners will be really surprised at that. But, um, I think the vast, vast majority of people I know would much rather be born today than be born in 1000 AD. So maybe you could unpack the case against modernity more and you know, see if you can persuade us that really we should rather be born in 1000, in 1000 AD. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I suppose in 1000 AD, the, the, stakes, the stakes were lower, right? You could, um, you could uh, find your village invaded by marauding hordes, but uh, that would be the end of your village, right? And, and not the end, of, um, the end of your hemisphere. Or, or I, uh, I'm a little confused about that because absolutely people care about the whole world. But, you know, if mm -hmm. you're living a thousand AD and then marauders come in and, you know, kill your family and murder you, mm -hmm. like to me, that it's not clear that someone should be less scared of that than they should be of, let's say, global warming or nuclear war. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, your village is is what you know. It's your whole life. And um, and it would be um, definitively upsetting uh, if it were to be burned to the ground. Of course, of course. And maybe I mean, maybe this thought experiment isn't all that productive. But what I'm trying to get at is something that will help us understand my general law or the uh, intuitive conviction that I have that human life has overall got neither better nor worse, and that this is, again, kind of a law-like equilibrium. You can say life expectancy is longer, but, you know, where's the argument that that 
makes life better, right? You need you also need an argument for that because 70 is still, you know, basically equal to 35 when compared to um, eternity, right? Um, and so simply getting better measures on some of the indices that, say, economists like to consider when they're looking at quality of life, I don't think that is entirely compelling. I think there are other, let's say, more broadly or more profoundly existential considerations that cannot even be touched upon by the kind of information economists study. So in that regard, but let's maybe let's let's maybe step away from that and look at look at some kind of narrower issues like uh, for example, pleasure, enjoyment, entertainment. It's pretty clear to me uh, and now as someone who has been around long enough to have actually lived through technological revolutions and um, to remember the pre-revolutionary state of things. It's pretty clear to me that, say, virtual reality is no better than cinema for triggering our imaginations and for inciting us to do what we do with our minds Right. Um, and uh, given that I've experienced that and I know that firsthand, it's pretty easy for me to extrapolate from that and say virtual reality goggles are also no better than, say, listening to an elder tell a story by the campfire. Right. When that's all you had or playing with little sculpted um Twigs um, is just as good as whatever most sophisticated AI driven electronic toys we have today. It's clear enough to me that our enjoyment doesn't actually get better, right? Because we have the same brains as our Paleolithic brothers and sisters, um, and uh, the brains are triggered to do their thing by different external objects, but that doesn't really change the nature of their thing, right? So maybe if you're not convinced by my claim of, let's say, historical equilibrium, <laughs> um, you might be more convinced, uh, in general, right, when I'm talking about the general kind of uh, indifference uh, as between uh, life in 1000 AD versus life in the 21st century. If you're not convinced by that, then you might be convinced by a consideration of something narrower, like what I've just alluded to, the history of, um, let's say, external prostheses for the incitement of our imaginative faculty. I would contend that cave paintings do just as well as movies do just as well as VR goggles. <laughs> I, you know, I wonder here, or I, I should say I worry here, that you may be taking your own preferences and assuming that other people have similar preferences. Because, um, I mean, I don't know, I think the vast majority of people would actually vastly prefer to live to 70 than live to 35. And it doesn't matter that compared to eternity, those are both round to zero. I think that the vast majority of people would enjoy movies more than cave paintings and that people who only have access to cave paintings would also enjoy movies more than cave paintings if they got to experience both and compare them. I mean, we, you know, we do have um, like almost like a laboratory like settings um, for observing what happens when, let's say, broadly speaking, a civilizational shift occurs where you move not from cave paintings to movies, but say where you move from bows and arrows to guns, right? Uh, or from reliance only upon your, your own two feet uh, to a society that's built around um, human equestrian uh, symbiosis, right? I'm talking in particular about Native American history before and after contact with Europeans, right? So this is a very vivid example. We know, obviously, that Native Americans wanted to get their hands on guns and alcohol and horses and all these things pretty fast. Did it make life better? Well, over several centuries, um, it, it gets some, at least for those who survive, it gets somewhat difficult to say. But, uh, uh, you know, if you go back to the original, let's say, 
uh, context of the encounter and of the introduction of new technologies and substances and animals, what you find is um, significant trauma and significant disadvantage that accompanies the introduction of um of of new technologies right um and in general now when we have debate around say the few lingering so-called uncontacted groups in the world in amazonia in the andaman islands though i think uncontacted is a bit of a misnomer whether you know we should let these people go on with their low life expectancies and um their their proneness to disease and perhaps with some some pathologies that we've rejected in the modern world like say child abuse and uh what we would see as child abuse and so on and so on the question is okay but what would their uh incorporation into modernity look like and the fact is that they're not going to get to join us at the higher levels at the higher floors of modernity right the only way into modernity for an uncontacted group is through proletarianization or through um uh let's say a move from the natural landscape or the traditional habitat that they've that they've been in for generations into urban slums or onto reserves right and that is definitely not a good deal for them right so if there were a way for the introduction of new technologies to uh mean uh let's say uh, a seamless transition into the benefits of modernity then perhaps the calculus would would, would change but we know from observing again and again countless historical cases that it just doesn't work like that right it never works like that what's well, easily me there's one question is how can a group that hasn't been part of modern development get pulled into modern development in a way that's healthy for that group and good for that group. And absolutely agree with you. There's lots of examples where, you know, when the kind of cutting edge technology meets a group that doesn't have it yet, it doesn't go well for the group, for that new group, often because they get exploited and, you know, and they can't defend themselves against the new technology and so forth. But that is also, I would say, separate from the question of, okay, but what about the people sort of are, they're riding near the edge of the technology. They've been, you know, they've grown up with it and they're continuing to grow with it. What kind of impacts does it have? I mean, I think, Virtually everyone would agree that technology has some harms and also that it creates some benefits. It seems to me that you see it as there's some kind of balancing act between the two, that there's some kind of equilibrium that the harms and and, and benefits occur together or in such a way that they balance each other. And I, I'm confused about why that would be. Like, I guess I think of it as more like we're drawing from a distribution of technologies. Some of them are kind of neutral. They don't make things better or worse for human values. Some of them make things better for human values. Some of them make things worse for human values. And I tend to think that the distribution, that the mean is is somewhat positive. In other words, that we're more, you know, like on average, we're drawing more things that make things a little bit better than make things a little bit worse. And so, you know, on net, we've made things better. The main exception I see to this is technologies that I think put the whole world at risk, whether it's bio technology that could help promote bioterrorism being more effective or climate change or dangerous AI, things like that. Yeah, I suppose um, what AI seems to be showing right now is that it might be the surprise that we had in the early 20th century. Uh, the letter Einstein wrote to, to FDR, I think it, it was in 1939, if I'm not mistaken, like surprisingly our research into the fundamental constituents of physical reality has um, caused us to stumble upon powers so great that they could destroy the world, that that was not a one-time thing, right? That that was not just characteristic of early 20th century physics, but it could, in fact, be the general direction that all probing into the nature of reality and that all efforts to learn how to more effectively manipulate reality lead to, 
right? And so in what I mean is that we're seeing perhaps, I'm saying perhaps now, I'm not saying this definitively, we're seeing right now perhaps a similar development in information science that we saw almost a century ago in physics. That is to say, you probe too deeply, you get too much control over the over the objects of your study, and sooner or later, you end up again with potentially world-destroying technology, right? And arguably, we've also done that over the past few centuries in our probing into um, the living world. And like you, you've just evoked bioterrorism. Um, so I'm not so sure that we can neatly uh, divide off the potentially world-destroying paths of technological research from the neutral ones. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not at all so sure. That said, one of the examples I, I, I like to discuss of win something, lose something equilibrium um, is uh, indeed in the earlier history of information technology uh, with the rise of the printing book, printing press and the sudden massive circulation of uh, printed books, which, you know, is arguably at least distally causal for, you know, countless people um, getting burned at the stake and for the wars of religion and all sorts of other nasty, violent stuff, right? You can see uh, some kind of link between, let's say, the new ability to easily publish Bibles in the Vulgate, for example, for example, English, and the suppression of of efforts to smuggle English Bibles across the channel and, you know, burning all, all sorts of people at the stake for trying and so on, right? Just, this is just an example. So was the printing revolution good? Uh, well, uh, it, it caused some turbulence for a while, but then overall, you know, we all, uh, we all learned to read and, and it made us smarter. Well, did it? Um, what we learn from Renaissance historians, from people who've worked on the history of, of the book and its place in culture, is that in fact what happened was that we just traded in one technology for another, and the older technology had the advantage of being more closely connected to techne in the, in the sense of skill. Right. So I'm thinking, for example, of Francis Yates's wonderful book, The Art of Memory, which he published in the 1960s on uh, the incredible mnemonic structures uh, that erudite medieval scholars built up in their minds in order to learn vast bodies of knowledge by heart, right, which they stopped doing at the minute, at the moment, they were able to store those vast bodies of knowledge on their shelves, on printed pages, right? And arguably, what we're experiencing in the early 21st century is something like a repeat of that kind of revolution, where now we don't even store the body of knowledge on our shelves or bother to read uh, the contents of what's on those shelves. We just have it at our fingertips on Wikipedia, prosthetically present at any moment we might choose to inform ourselves about it, right? And that's a profound transformation. Again, it's a transformation I myself have lived through. Whether it's overall good or not, I think is a question that can't even in principle be answered. But from my point of view, it's not obviously progress either. It's more something like trading one techne for another. And personally, and maybe this is again, as you've as you've already suspected, just my own sensibility, just my own idiosyncrasy, and also perhaps having something to do with getting older. Personally, I see tremendous value in those technes that uh, where we would translate the Greek term techne not as gadget, but as skill, right? That is to say, those technologies 
like the medieval art of memory that are not externalized into an outer object, an apparatus of some sort, but that are that we carry around inside of us as learned skills. I think that's intrinsic to what it is to be a human being. And I think it's it's uh, we should think of each time we lose such a skill, we should think of it somewhat on analogy to the way we think of, say, uh, species extinction or uh, or language loss, right? These are things that are intrinsically valuable. Do people of different genders actually have different personalities? We've all heard that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, but we've also heard that men and women are actually no different from each other at their core. Clearly, both of these perspectives can't be right. Is one of them accurate, or are they both just sensationalized nonsense? To try to answer these questions, the team at clearerthinking.org analyzed enormous amounts of data, ran 15 separate studies, and have now published their results in the form of a free, data-driven test called the Gender Continuum Test. You can take this fun test to learn about the relationship between gender and personality based on data from more than 15,000 people. And you'll probably learn some things about yourself in the process too, since it'll provide a personalized analysis of your personality. To take the Gender Continuum test or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and mini courses, visit clearerthinking.org. You know, I find the printing press example to be strange because we went from a very rarefied class of a very small number of people that could read to allowing most people to read. And to me, that seems like a massive benefit. And I, I don't even see those as comparable, given how few people could read before the printing press. What's so good about reading, though? Uh, why, is, why is reading so good? Reading is almost certainly uh, going to turn out to have been a tiny blip in human history, something people did for a, hu a few thousand years and then moved on before moving on to something else. And there is a, a form of knowledge that precedes the history of literacy that by and that, you know, that has been around vastly longer than literacy in our sense that consists in, you know, reading the edges of leaves, reading the quality of the soil, reading animal tracks, and so on and so on, which is, again, uh, an activation of the human mind that is exactly the same human mind as the one that we use when we read, right? So indeed, if you look at the past 500 years, it's certainly um, good at some kind of mid-range view or maybe even a zoomed-in view to say that the literacy rate is going up. But what is literacy? It's a blip. It's a minor point about a short period of human history. It's not something human beings, qua human beings, ought to be doing. Well, I don't care about reading for its own sake. What matters to me is that people get the things that they fundamentally care about, that they are able to achieve their intrinsic values. And to me, the literacy rate going up and the widespread uh, availability of books is good because it helps people get the things that they want, um, the things that they intrinsically value. Yeah. Okay, so this is getting us to the heart of the matter, right? Because what we intrinsically value changes depending on what the available technologies are, right? A paleolithic person who knew how to read the information in the edges of serrated leaves, for example, or in the quality of the soil or whatever, was not lacking anything he or she intrinsically wanted any more than you and I are lacking something when we acknowledge that we are unable to teletransport, right? And uh, so this gets really gets to the heart of the matter about the history of technology, that new technologies don't so much give us something we were lacking as add something more to the list of things we need in order not to be lacking, right? <laughs> I mean, I think you make a good point that sometimes it it creates new intrinsic values that couldn't have existed before. But also, you know, if you were a paleolithic person, you and your family might have been bitten by flies all the time. And technology does alleviate something that 
that it does relate to your intrinsic values, which is, you know, not constantly being in suffering or technology makes it possible to save your daughter from a disease that you don't want your daughter to die of because you intrinsically value, you know, your daughter and so on. So I, I think it's both. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's curious. I don't mean to be pushing too hard a line. And I realize I, you know, I, I'm kind of stating my, my, my wariness, uh, boldly in a way that, might make it sound like I'm dogmatically committed to it. And I'm not like I acknowledge that we are in certain respects, a very special species because it's intrinsic to the human more or less from the, you know, from the beginning of what's sometimes called, you know, the, the human revolution. I'm thinking of paleoanthropologists like um, Colin Renfrew here. It's pretty clear that being an anatomically modern human over the past whatever 150 250 thousand years you know the the timeline is always being revised but being an anatomically modern human means by definition relying on technology right relying on external tools to make our our lives i don't want to say better but to make our lives distinctly human right and that was true ab initio um so that it's not as if we've we've fallen from an earlier state of perfect harmony with nature or anything like that um and you know daniel dennett has some wonderful reflections on the um the um the process whereby innovations become necessities and this actually happens you know in the course of evolution even uh before you can speak of anything like hominid technological innovations you've got for example the loss in our primate lineage of um the ability to synthesize vitamin C, right? Other primates can do that. We can't. So if we go out to sea, uh, that is out to the ocean, and um, we have no citrus, we'll, we'll die of scurvy. So we lost that ability because we started eating fruit, and eating fruit became a kind of, among other things, a cultural glue, going out and collecting fruit together. Similarly, and more obviously technologically, um, with the innovation of cooking, which serves to partially digest our food when it's still outside of us, and to do so in a collective social way. But then the, that's the upside. The downside is that we're a lot less able than other uh, animal species to just go around and eat stuff we find in our environment raw, right? So these are trade-offs. And it's so deep, this problem of the trade-off that, you know, as the case of vitamin C shows, it even precedes um our beginnings as homo faber, as a species that makes things even before that gets going, right? So it's a real problem and it's, it's, in, it's intrinsic just to the nature of the default setting of our existence. And I don't have any, any answers. And again, that's, that's why I'm not an anarcho-primitivist. I don't think there's any original harmonic state uh, to go back to. Let's jump to the next topic, which is the idea of algorithmic content and art being replaced by it. So how would you set this up for us? Well, this is something I, I did manage to cover. Uh, I was already thinking about this in my 2022 book. And here as well, I recognize that a lot of this is just a kind of dis putting my, my own preferences and idiosyncrasies on display and also putting my age on display as being someone whose early aesthetic and intellectual sensibilities were shaped by what I would consider non-algorithmic processes, that is to say, mostly random uh, events. Right. So, for example, you go to the used record store and you look in the bargain bin and um, you flip through the records that are in the bargain bin and you find a truly heterogeneous um, collection of um, of artists and styles. Right. It's not algorithmic. Um, I can't find that on Spotify or Apple Tunes or I iTunes. Um, sorry, Apple I iTunes today because um, they are. Are deploying uh, 
criteria of similarity, you know, beats per minute or uh, whatever, that are uh, criteria that artificial intelligence is capable of recognizing and doing something with, right? So I'm being served up music, one song after another on Spotify uh, that AI predicts will uh, be to my liking because it's supposed to have some similarity to what preceded it. Whereas in fact, what would be to my liking is to be able to go back and have the sort of experience I had with the bargain bin at the used record store, right? Which is to say, to experience um, true heteroclitic barrage of different styles and artists, right? That's getting harder and harder to do. The, um, the portals for what I consider to be true aesthetic awakening are narrowing and people are going to disagree with me and, and they're just going to say i'm i'm I, I just sound like a like a crabby old person fine but things really have changed <laughs> um and um, and we need to take stock of the of the the historical significance of that change and what it represents for our future as um as aesthetes as um creatures that i think fundamentally require encounters with um with art in order to in order to thrive so that's one side of it and i i suppose that's kind of the negative side or the side that i'm most pessimistic about but i also think that um with the rise of AI art and the ultimately the emerging situation where we're not going to need as art consumers, we're not going to need artists because we can just have AI, you know, generate the works that we desire for us uh, directly without human uh, involvement or direct human involvement. The good side of that is perhaps a kind of um, move back to what I understand of the primary lineages of aesthetics in the early 19th century, particularly with people like Friedrich Schiller, for whom the key element of experience of art is not consumption, but creation, right? And uh, once we are in a situation where we don't have cer a certain class of people, the consumers, relying on another class of people, the artists, to provide us with the art that we want to consume, we might be in a s situation where each of us can finally say, I'm going to be an artist and I'm going to create the kind of art that I want. Now, am I going to use AI tools to do this or am I going to go more low tech DIY and, you know, get out the construction paper? <laughs> That's the great thing about being an artist. It's up to you, right? You can decide. But the prospects for art consumers, pure consumers in the 21st century are bleak indeed. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because now that you have tools like Midjourney that can create really beautiful looking images, and here by beautiful, I just mean that the average person would rate them as beautiful, regardless of what you in particular think. To, to some people, this is a horrifying thing because it's basically trying to replacing like genuine human creativity and passion with something that's sort of like some kind of weird weighted average of all of the images ever created on the internet. To other people, this is a wonderful thing because it now means that you can create beautiful things yourself that used to require an incredible amount of skill, and now you can make them in a few minutes. So, yeah, I'm wondering if you also see a positive here or you think it's, it's really just a negative. No, no, no. That's precisely the, the positive element that I, that I wanted to emphasize. I think um, this is a golden age for, let's say, the universalization or the democratization of artistic creativity, which is really the more important side of the pairing between creation and consumption, right? But I also, at the same time, think that this is a this is an era of tremendous Philistinism where uh, cons art, 
art consumers are increasingly ill-equipped to search out um, for themselves the kind of art that will really build them up and to understand the kind of val- the useful, meaningful criteria for how to search it out, right? That's a real crisis. On the other hand, um, all along, there have been more important things to do with art than to consume it, right? (laughs) In particular, to create it. Um, And so, indeed, the positive side is um, the democratization of artistic creation. So what what is the difference between art that builds us up and art that is sort of, I don't know, irrelevant or has no positive benefits? Well, I, I I mean, I suppose that the the difference is precisely um, between uh, between art and what is being called content, right? I think of content as fundamentally a different species, a different category of cultural artifact than a work of art because it is being churned out according to, algorithmic criteria when and of course there are there are hybrids i don't want to open a can of worms here and i haven't seen the movie but from what i've read uh, of barbie uh this is the result of the collision between some kind of creative imperative that greta gerwig herself feels inside of her as a creative, the collision between that and the armies of suits with their audience surveys and their eyeball tracking saying, no, no, we got to put in more of this or that, right? Now, with the recent Hollywood strike, um, we're becoming aware of this, this plausible future scenario, near future scenario, where it's only the eyeball tracking equipment that determines the entire content from start to finish of a given entertainment, right? Like we need an explosion 36 seconds in and not 38 seconds in or whatever, because that will maximize audience captivation, right? And when you listen to, you know, utter Philistines like Jeff Bezos talk about Amazon's entry into content production. You know, he said something really naive and almost sweet, like, I think I understand a good story and I've got the equipment to, you know, to churn good stories out. What he means is algorithmically maximized audience captivation, right? And yeah, I mean, you're going to succeed. You're going to captivate your audiences, but we're going to lose from the landscape anything that looks even remotely related to what in the 20th century could still respectively be called the avant-garde, right? That is to say, difficult things to watch, like Andy Warhol's single shot a film of the Empire State Building that lasts eight hours, right? Um, what algorithm is going to tell you to go and sit through that, right? Or tell tell you that you, that it would be advisable to re, to release such a thing into the world? No algorithm could could conceivably lead us in that direction. So it's the death of the avant-garde. And indeed, we see this with what little we have of um, of an intellectual life in 21st century United States is mostly people from the publishing and academic academic worlds bickering with one another about um about mainstream entertainments like Barbie or Oppenheimer, right? Um that's a dismal state of affairs. In the previous century, intellectuals did not care about mainstream entertainments like that because they were trying to push themselves to explore the most difficult and least inviting creations of the human imagination you could come up with. That is the artistic impulse. That is the true artistic impulse. And it's fundamentally at odds with everything the concept of content suggests. I get a bit heated about this. I and again, I'm stating things in the in the boldest way possible, even even if I I understand that it is perhaps overbold. 
No, I, I, I get that. And I, I could see a couple different things coming out of this regarding, okay, why can't algorithms recommend things that are deeper or more avant-garde, right? Like one path there I see is that the things that we can measure may just not be the right things, right? Like if you could really measure what is deep and profoundly effective on people, then maybe you could algorithmically recommend this stuff. But maybe that stuff is just really hard to measure, or in some cases impossible to measure. On the other side, maybe the issue is that new things can't really be recommended. Like if you have no data on them, they're really so novel, then how are you going to recommend it? You don't even know what to compare it to. Would you say those are both aspects of what you're talking about? Well, I mean, yeah, like what what could an, an algorithm knows you've just sat through Andy Warhol's empire and stared at a single shot of the Empire State Building for eight hours. So what is it going to tell you next? You should stare at, you know, this 12 hour shot of the Chrysler Building or something like that. And that would be like utterly wrong, right? Like it's not that you want to just see long, dull movies about skyscrapers in general, it's that this one intervention was doing something in particular that I would say it's going to be pretty hard for an algorithm to learn what that is, right? Because, you know, algorithms do not have a share in this very difficult task of free play of the imagination, right? Almost by definition, if you look at, say, classical aesthetic theory, again, to go back to Schiller or to Kant, um, what is um, artistic genius? It is precisely the move made by an artist that can't be reduced to a rule that seems to be governed by no rule, right? So you can write a handbook of introduction to uh, oil painting for dummies or whatever, and you can give the broad outlines of what you're supposed to do when you're mixing your pigments and so on, but you cannot include a, a concluding chapter of your painting for dummies book on how to be a genius painter, right? You just can't do that. And, um, that's the difference between a kind of competent entertainment and high art. And, you know, we can debate the kind of historical circumstances when this ideal of high art emerged and whether it's really something worth preserving. I, I happen to think it is, but in any case, whether it's worth preserving or not, um, we need to take stock of the significance of its loss. I want to point out a couple of different types of algorithms that are used for recommending because I think it's relevant here. One type of algorithm looks at the attributes of the item being recommended. So Pandora, for example, with music, my understanding is that they went and they said, okay, what are the different attributes of songs? You know, you've got rhythm and you've got what genre it is and so on. And they kind of added all these attributes to different songs and then they use that to recommend. But there's a very, very different type of recommendation algorithm, sometimes called collaborative filtering. And the idea of it is it looks for people that like things like you and then it recommends other things that they like. And so it seems to me the former is going to is going to be unlikely to kind of get at what you're talking about, but maybe the latter approach, the collaborative filtering, could recommend things that that say would be really appealing to someone who who watched an Andy Warhol film, you know, that's eight hours of the Empire State Building, because maybe there's other things that that person would like that you also would like. Yeah, well, certainly that looks like just you know using technology to facilitate human interaction and communication, right? And that is indeed very different. In general, though, there's a danger that we won't have anyone left in this world uh, to share our tastes and sensibilities if this world goes full-on Philistine, right? Which is what we can suspect is happening. For example, it drives me crazy. You know, the only time I watch movies these days pretty much is when I'm on long-haul flights. It's the only thing I can do. And um, if you read the little description of the movie in question, it typically attempts to summarize the plot, right? Now, from my point of view, as a what I think is some kind of non-Philistine cinephile, who gives a shit about the plot? That's not what counts. What counts is the year it was made, 
the director whose vision it was <laughs> um and you know maybe some um some qualities of the the cinematography what kind of film it was shot on and so on and so on and if we're living in a world where the human priorities that shape the algorithms are so off target with respect to what really matters about the work in question then i'm pessimistic about even the algorithms that bring us together in the way you described, that there will be anything for, you know, the, the two human beings brought together in this way to meaningfully share. I'm sorry, I know I'm being, I'm, I'm being very, very uh, opinionated and uh, uh, blunt today. <laughs> I don't know what's got into me. No, it's, uh, it's totally fine. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you clearly are very passionate <laughs> about your view. But I, I, you know, I can't help but feel that your view is sort of has underneath it this sort of distaste for the way the modern world is. And then there's like, the, you have such a strong distaste for it that it makes you want to attack the modern world. Is that unfair? Well, that that's pretty fair. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I think most of my in scare quotes, content consumption is is reading 19th century literature. And, you know, I feel like Henry James um, was at the top of an art form that penetrated into the depths of the human soul and that this peaked sometime around 1880. Um, and I've lo I look for traces of that in the contemporary world and it's hard to find. So I, I admit, you know, I confess that I'm... Um, that I'm backward looking and I'm somewhat lost in the contemporary world. But, um, but I also think that people like me who are lost in this world um, and who are trying to hold on to and, you know, bring forth and remind other people of things that have been lost. I, I, I hope that we, we have something to provide to our, to our, to our era, to our contemporaries. Otherwise, we're just in a, you know, a, a kind of constant stream of <laughs> the eternal present, you know, <laughs> and uh, a constant forgetfulness. To a listener who might say, well, aren't there a, a lot of amazing pieces of art and music and you know, film being created today? I mean, you know, we have more stuff being created today than ever before of all different you know, genres and varieties. I mean, what would you say to that? Would you say that they've lost something essential and in, in some fundamental way, they're lower quality? Yeah, I definitely. I think if you look, for example, at um, the the turn to mostly CGI dependent superhero movies in Hollywood over the past generation, I think this is just clearly Hollywood in its death throes, right? That this this will not go on. They've just kind of defaulted to an approach that is the safe route, the one that works financially for now, and abandoned any hope uh, for being uh, central to the culture in the in the long run. Meanwhile, I think, and I and I and I, I say this rather categorically that it that the Hollywood. Uh, output has simply collapsed over the past generation. There's virtually nothing of any value uh, coming out um, of in terms of mainstream cinematic entertainment. And I see this as happening um, uh, for uh, obviously large economic and material reasons that have mostly to do with the fact that it's been Hollywood has been rendered otios um, by new technologies. So creativity is surging up organically in other places. And you know when I when I'm pessimistic and when I'm uh, looking for the avant-garde where when I'm looking for genuine creative um, uh, impulse on display, I can find it still even now in um, the subcultural mimetic um, productions uh, of mostly 
anonymous teenagers on the internet, right? I think that's where um, the culture is at right now. And I would take, um, I would take the, you know, the, the, the mimetic exuberance of, um, of young people over, um, you know, multi-million dollar uh, Hollywood blockbuster <laughs> any day. It's a lot cheaper for one thing. Um, you know, cinema's dead. Um, that's that's certain. Literature seems basically to be dead. Uh, you know, again, for the uh, in consequence of the same economic and material transformations that has turned Hollywood into um, a content mill these days um, in uh, big trade publishing they are doing nothing but the equivalent of um of eyeball tracking you know uh trying to predict what um what phrasings will um will be the most profitable um down to the the sentence or the word word level i mean i i know this firsthand i i've worked with um with agents trying to refine my own book proposals into um into the kind of proposals that that publishers um, will respond to, and agents have a very very clear idea of you know how much money is being lost each time you deploy a multisyllabic word or a word in uh, French or German, right? <laughs> like they're literally docking it from your advance uh, contract if you dare to throw in a foreign term, for example. So books are dead, movies are dead, um, but of course human beings are going to keep on being their their, their creative selves, um, just like they've been since the Paleolithic, because you can't stop them, right? Um, and the, the problem now is just, um, is just knowing where to look for it. Do you have an idea for a digital product that could improve the world? Are you frustrated by cookie cutter survey platforms that don't give you the level of personalization you need for your research content? Guided Track might be what you're looking for. Guided Track will empower you to effortlessly create and launch apps, surveys, educational modules, prototypes, and online tools, even if you have no programming experience. From Ayla's famous kink survey to the quiz called Can You Guess Which Studies Replicate, made by 80,000 Hours, Guided Track's easy to use platform and flexible interface has enabled some of the most creative people and organizations to bring their impactful ideas to life. In fact, it's what we've used to build all 70 of Clearer Thinking's interactive digital tools. To make it even easier for you to embark on your next project, we've recently launched 10 free templates. Simply choose the template that aligns best with your goals and customize the content as needed. But you want to know what the best part is? Guided Track is completely free to use. So visit guidedtrack.com to sign up for your free account and start making your next big thing. You know, I certainly can see why you would have a problem with Hollywood trying to turn movies into sort of economic machines and why you might have a problem with the way that some publishers operate. But we also live in an era of incredibly numerous amounts of self-published works in books and also in, um, in film. Like so many indie films are produced every year. Do you also view those as valueless? And if so, what's, what's wrong with them? These are not things that are done by Hollywood or you know, or forced on, on people by their, their publishers or agents. Yeah. I mean, certainly, um, every sign of the vitality and survival of the D DIY impulse, um, it gets me right in the feels as they say, um, you know, I, 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 I'm really happy to see it. And I admit I'm not, terribly attentive um to all the kind of underground bubblings that are going on i can say that um you know the uh kind of indie uh, the somewhat mainstream um indie film circuit strikes me as pretty um pretty lifeless or as imitating an idea of um what art should be that's become uh, scler sclerotic and um and so to speak pantomimed but on the other hand uh i again as i said you know i i, I brought up memes and kind of mimetic subcultures um but on the other hand with writing 
um, with music. Um, I think this is a, indeed a, a, a promising era for um, for DIY creativity, which is, I think, the only hope for the survival of art, right? Um, in uh, in a in a world that is so rigorously algorithmic and financialized. Just to really clarify, besides saying that you don't enjoy it, what do you actually see as wrong with the kind of self-published works that are happening now? Is it you view them as not novel, not innovative? No, no, no. Again, again, I'm 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 on the side of DIY. I'm wherever. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a substacker myself. Right, but you're right? So but you're I still am. saying that uh, they're not that the, the self-published stuff is not is somehow less vibrant than historical work. No. No, um, definitely not. No, I mean, I again, I did say, I guess I did say with respect to um, indie uh, films, my again, a not very um, deep take here, uh, because you know, just because I've been out of it for years, I'm less into it than I used to be. Um, my not very well informed take is that indie films are a faint echo of what, um, uh, of some some kind of dated idea of what independent art should look like. Um, there's a, a, a film critic I, I really like to read, Nick Pinkerton, who's also on Substack, and he wrote some brilliant pieces about live streaming, you know, these cretinous young men who go out and do stupid stunts uh, and stream it on the internet. And Nick Pinkerton was arguing that, you know, that is where it's at right now. That is real DIY cinema uh, in a lineage that goes back to, say, Ziga Vertov in the, the silent film era. I found that very compelling. What I don't find compelling is, say, Christopher Nolan, right? Uh, or maybe that's not a very good example. Wes Anderson, you know, the um, the indie branded um, Hollywood content. Um, uh, I, I, I don't find it compelling at all. In general, though, independently produced DIY output is um, is is great. It's where it's at. I I I I, I produce it myself on my Substack, stack. Um, and I think that's the most valuable lifeline for myself as a, a thinker and a writer. And I want to encourage more people to do it. And uh, also at the same time to be aware of the dangers of um, omnipresent of the omnipresent forces of of of, of financialization and algorithmization. Substack is a is a curious thing because it's to some extent prone to the same forces as social media where you know on Twitter people end up all saying the same ridiculous things as one another because they see it incentivized in the form of likes or or faves or whatever. On Substack we we are somewhat um protected from that um because it's sort of just ourselves alone writing but nonetheless even there we have some idea of which things uh, to say to get the most engagement and um, ultimately to get the highest highest returns on our efforts, right? So there's no easy solution, and even DIY stuff is um, is not completely safe. Do you see those two one algorithms and two financialization as kind of the main culprits to art declining, as in your view? I would put financialization first, you know, that's the that's the evil number one, right? Because algorithms in themselves are neither good nor bad. It's how they're used. And um, the problem is simply that in the current political economic order, they can only be used for maximizing profit, right? <laughs> um, and um, and that's 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 how we end up with um Ant and B or whatever the movies like that are, you know, was that was that the name of a movie recently? The 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 some some superhero movie where someone turns into an ant and the other one turns into a bee and it's all CGI. I don't know. You know, I I just see ads for this stuff on billboards or on the sides of buses when I'm walking around Paris. I I don't I don't know what they are. <laughs> I just know it's terrible. <laughs> so. You mentioned, you know, just to, to get to point at the sort of glimmer of light from your perspective, you point at some interesting stuff happening from your point of view from anonymous young people on the internet. 
What is that stuff that you're seeing that's getting you excited? I mean, I just think the kids on Twitter are funny, you know? Um, sorry, I meant Ant-Man and the Wasp. That, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I was referring to. Um, I, I just think there's a kind of vitality and an ebullience in this kind of quick-witted um, takesmanship that you see on social media, media that really makes me think this, this is the vanguard of our culture, right? And this is often um, accompanied by rather ingenious innovations in kind of the presentation of information in a in a way that combines text and image, i.e. the classic meme, right? I think there's incredible stuff happening there. Um, unfortunately, I find a lot of it politically noxious. Even even when I I recognize that it's the aesthetic vanguard, um, I think for better or worse, right now the people who are taking up that vanguard and running with it are people who um, you know fall broadly speaking um, uh, into what I th what I see as the reactionary right. And thus, you know, in a, in a sense, we're in a kind of 1920s moment where you've got um, futurism uh, being pursued both by, say, fascists like M Marinetti and by um, uh, by communists like Mayakovsky. But then eventually the communists uh, veer off into some dull literalist social real so socialist realism. And the only people still doing the exciting boundary pushing stuff are the reactionaries. I feel like we're in a situation like that. And and I'm, you know, this gets us to another topic, which is maybe the the decline of the humanities. I feel like um, in the academic humanities, where uh, kind of political progressivism prevails, you just find zero imagination at work, almost, you know, uh, uh, as a corollary to that point, right? So um, it's a peculiar moment right now. Um, I spent, you know, in my childhood and adolescence and young adulthood, I just took it for granted that it was the left that was always going to be um, at the forefront of um, of artistic creative innovation because, you know, the my earliest reference points were like say abby hoffman pretending to levitate the pentagon <laughs> you know that that's what i and, and then the and then the right wingers were a bunch of a bunch of stodgy boring dads in suits right so i just took it for granted that that's how things were and over the past decade um valence has has has, has completely shifted in a way that i that i that i find kind of delirious um but indeed I think the kids on social media are infinitely creative. And if they would just stop flirting with such noxious ideas so often, I, I would I would say they're the hope for the future. They're our hope for the future. <laughs> Before we wrap up, you know, two topics that we had uh, planned to perhaps talk about are the decline of academic humanities and also of liberal democracy. So do you want to just, uh, you know, give us a few comments on that before we finish? Well, I would say decline of the academic humanities. I wouldn't say the decline of liberal democracy, but certainly um, uh, the the significant threats to liberal democracy that um, place it in a more precarious spot than um, I would have thought possible earlier in in my life prior to the 2010s. Let's say uh, maybe I can just really quickly take on both of these uh, at the same time because you know the the two are related. You know when you look, for example, at the number of undergraduates who um, uh, say things to the effect that you know the our First Amendment liberal rights um, should be abandoned in cases where it involves insult to to marginalized groups or to persecuted minorities. You know, there's obviously discussions to be had there about the boundaries between free speech and hate speech. I'm aware of all of this. Um, at the same time, the insouciance with which the younger generation today speaks of moving beyond sacrosanct liberal rights, I think is 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 rather disconcerting and doesn't bode well for um 
for liberal freedoms, um, the future in the coming years. And this is connected, I think, to um, to the decline of the humanities, um, uh, a field I know well. I've been uh, in the academic humanities for a few decades now. And, you know, I think I got into it because I saw it as uh, an area that um, was at shared at least certain basic um, features with the arts, um, right? That is to say that you get interested in these things in, say, 17th century metaphysics or the history of the life sciences in early modern Europe or whatever. You get interested in these things because it's pleasing to your imagination, right? It It's an incitement to uh, to look at the world and, you know, to behold it in wonder, right? And um, uh, since I began my career, that understanding of what you're doing in the humanities has just vanished. It has just gone away and has been replaced by a new understanding. Again, like the transformation of Hollywood, like the transformation of publishing, this new understanding is being driven by um, material and economic forces that are too large for anyone to really do anything about. But the result in the academic humanities is um, that uh, one must now continually demonstrate and reaffirm the relevance of one's domain of interest to um, solving contemporary problems as they happen to be understood in the contemporary moment, right? Rather than looking for strange and forgotten life worlds uh, that might add value to our contemporary life in ways that we cannot, um, we cannot foresee that we cannot dictate in advance, right? That has just entirely disappeared. And indeed, at this point, I no longer see the academic humanities as really doing their duty of preserving or indeed um, cultivating anything of, of, of real value. And so what's the alternative if you continue to value those things? Well, again, just like with movies, just like with writing, it's DIY. You just do it yourself, right? Because uh, because uh, Hollywood's not going to save us. Um, Far Strauss Giroux or Simon and Schuster aren't going to save us, and the universities definitely aren't going to save us. <laughs> so I think some people might wonder why would having to justify what you're doing in terms of value in modern society make it not have value? Because I think that's essentially what you're arguing that, that destroys the value of it. Well, look, I mean, I've seen, for example, a sudden transformation of the study of the history of philosophy in, a, in an attempt to make it fit with our contemporary early 21st century American understanding of the value of diversity, right? And I often have trouble articulating this because I end up sounding like I'm some kind of reactionary myself, and I really don't think I am. But I can assure you that people in um, classical India or in early modern Europe did not carve up social reality uh, in the way that we do today under the banner of diversity. And it fundamentally distorts the world as they understood it to talk about, say, Indian philosophers from the 4th century BCE as philosophers of, uh, of a marginalized um, uh, ethnicity, for example. Right? They weren't marginalized. They were Brahmins. They were they were at the very, very top of an elite and extremely hierarchically structured society. Right? So I teach Indian philosophy. I have a lot of trouble teaching Indian philosophy in order for the administration to cover a diversity requirement, if that makes any sense. Right? So by retrieving and exposing the world in the way that an ancient Indian philosopher or an early modern European philosopher saw the world. We're exposing ourselves to other possibilities, to other ways of understanding, processing social reality, and to make it in some 
kind of a priori and dictated way to make it relevant to our contemporary social reality by dictate is just fundamentally anti-intellectual, fundamentally unfaithful to the project of humanistic inquiry as it had shaped up since roughly the 18th century. And I have seen it collapse literally since I began my career two decades ago. <laughs> so again, that's why, you know, I, I think there, there's still hope, you know, people are still, you know, it's not like we're forgetting about classical Indian philosophy or anything like that. It's just that our institutions are distorting it because of short-term and ultimately small-minded imperatives. So would you say that because of a desire to put these kinds of works through a, a modern lens of how to do good, that's the sort of source of the distortion? That's a big part of it. That's that's one way of seeing it. Just, I mean, uh, what I would put it more extremely, what we're seeing is a bunch of non-intellectual administrators, that is to say, you know, people who have never seen it in uh, as part of their lot in life uh, to be intellectuals. We're seeing non-intellectual administrators dictating ever-changing uh, priorities that have nothing to do with what humanistic inquiry actually is in the way we have built it up over the centuries. And these priorities will change. I mean, for the past few years, it's been about, um, about DEI as a central, central value in the mission of the university. That's diversity, equality, and inclusion. Equality or equity? equity. That's right. And they, they make distinction, distinctions on that point. Um, the recent Supreme Court decision is going to complicate that. But for all we know, there could be a, you know, a right wing regime in power in the next few years that's going to tell us that, you know, that the real that our real mission is, um, you know, to um, draw out and celebrate our national greatness or something like that. And then we're going to have a bunch of idiot non intellectual administrators in our universities, making that the central mission of the university, um, at which point us real humanists will also be saying, no, no, that's not what we're doing, right? So it's the it's this subjection to um, administrative vicissitudes, these short-term changes in in the in the way the wind is blowing that I'm objecting to not say you know diversity as such obviously not right um, and I I feel you know throughout say the the aughts and the the 2010s I was kind of think one of the louder people saying we need to teach more non-European philosophy, we need to find new ways of drawing out marginalized voices and all of that. And I absolutely believe this, but I don't believe it because some DEI functionary is telling me that this is now the mission of our universities. I believe it for sound intellectual reasons, right? <laughs> It seems like an overarching theme in this conversation is sort of short-term, narrow-minded incentives as opposed to people pursuing things based on their own motivations and their own creative enterprise. Yeah, would you would you agree with that, that that, that sort of has been a thread through many of these critiques? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And yeah, again, maybe this is just kind of, you know, what this really amounts to is just taking my pulse, right? <laughs> so checking in and seeing where I'm at circa 2023. Uh, and indeed, I am at a point where, um, you know, I only want to pay attention to things for my own reasons. And and these are reasons that have um, kind of grown up within me organically over the years. Um, and I don't want those... Um, threatened by outside forces, whether they are algorithms or human resources bureaucrats <laughs> or um, any of the other people who, or any of the other forces that that are, uh, as I see it, um, aggressively trying to shape the way we think. Justin, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for listening to my Philippics. 
Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by We Amplify. Miles Kestrin handles marketing for the podcast, and Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. If you like our show, then we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. To sign up for that newsletter or to find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit podcast.clearerthinking.org. A listener asks, if you were going to learn to speak a foreign language, how would you do it? Yeah, so I don't speak any foreign languages. I, I do know a bunch of programming languages, but I don't think that counts to most people. Um, I always felt like I was bad at foreign languages in school, but I uh, and I think part of it was just it didn't come naturally to me, and part of it, I, I didn't have a lot of interest in, in high school, so I did kind of study some languages, like I studied French, but I just didn't make much progress and wasn't that interested. If I was going to approach it today, I think I would do a few things. One, I think I would use space repetition. So basically learning a concept or idea or sound or word and then making sure to review it shortly after to make sure I still remember it and then create a, if I get it right, make a longer delay and then review it again. And with each review, making sure the review is a quiz, not just like passively rereading it, but making sure it's a quiz each time. So we built a tool Thought Saver that can help with this, that can do automated space repetition for you. So I would I would definitely use that. In addition to that, I think immersion, you know, the people I speak to who speak foreign languages just says immersion works really, really well. So in addition to doing kind of flashcard type quizzing, really putting yourself in that place where you can speak that language all day long and you're sort of forced to do it, I think the two of those together probably would accelerate learning a tremendous amount.